Mr. Blanchard, okay. Ken, <laughs> we've been talking about leadership, organization, all kinds of subjects, and now actually we are in the midst of the section on strategy. What are your thoughts on corporate strategy? What's, what's wrong with <clears throat> corporate strategy? What's right and what should we know? Well, Ben, you know, as you, as you know, I'm a big fan of servant leadership. And uh, when I mention that to audiences, they, a lot of them think I'm talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody or some kind of religious movement. But uh, there's really two parts of servant leadership. One is strategic leadership, when you set your vision and your values and your strategy and your goals. And that's the responsibility of the hierarchy doesn't mean you don't involve people, but it's your responsibility to make sure people know where you're going and what's going to guide your journey. And uh, so that's the leadership part of servant leadership, because leadership is about going somewhere. Then uh, the second part of servant leadership is operational leadership. And that's when you turn the pyramid philosophically upside down, and now you're trying to get people to live according to the vision and values, uh, you know, complete the strategy and work on the strategy and, and the goals. And uh, what happens in, in our research, we have found that about 80 to 85 percent of the impact on employee engagement and employee motivation comes from operational leadership. But that doesn't mean that strategic leadership isn't important because it's key. Without it, there's nothing to follow. And if people don't know what the vision and direction and strategy is, the only thing they get to serve is themselves. And organizations that aren't clear on that have a real problem because everybody's protecting their own thing. They're into five fiefdoms and all that kind of thing. And so... Uh, when you, though, turn that pyramid upside down, because I know one of the big questions is, how do you implement it? Well, that's the main job of all, all the management hierarchy through the organization. Well, but that would be actually my, 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 my second down, question to you. That would actually be my second question well, to you, because I can understand that, you know, you need strategic leadership, you need operational leadership, I get that. But, you know, in many corporations, people lead as much as possible, but still about 80%, that's a figure I heard today, about 80% of all the strategies that gets developed never get implemented. What's, what's wrong? What's going wrong there? Let, let me just finish my thought, and then I'll answer that question, is that I said that about 80 to 85% is on operational leadership right. in terms of impacting people's uh, employee engagement and all. And if people are fully engaged and excited because you're implementing your strategy and your values and your goals, then they're going to go out of, way, out of the way to take, your, take care of your second most important customer because your people are your most important customer. They're going to now take care of your second most important customer, the people who use your products and services. Okay. And when they take care of them, they're going to become raving fans. They're going to be believers in your organization and they're going to be part of your sales force. And then that takes care of the third most important customer, your stockholders, the, the owners and all. And a lot of times we have that mixed up. We think that profit, you know, is the only reason to be in business. No, profit is the applause you get for taking care of your people. So they're going to go out of their way to take care of your customers. Now, in terms of your question about it, it not being implemented, right. that's because... What they do is they put the strategy and the vision and the values in some kind of plaque and put it on the wall, but nobody does anything for you. If you are a manager in an organization, particularly if you're running the organization, your job is to be like a third grade teacher. You have to say the vision and values and strategies and goals over and over and over again so people get it right, right. In other words, it's got to be part of the thinking every single day, and then you got to hold the people responsible for implementing it, and that's when you got to turn the pyramid upside down. You don't sit there evaluating and judging. You mm -hmm. roll your sleeves up and you do everything to help them uh, live according to your vision, values, and and uh, accomplish your strategies and goals. Okay, very interesting. Now, a lot of people, of course, don't work in large corporations. And I think also many visitors here today kind of have the feeling, okay, you talk about implementation in large organizations, that's what we do a lot during this kind of seminars, but there's also implementation on an individual level, 
like being here today and hearing lots of great new ideas, writing down creative new ideas, and then getting back home or getting back at the office next week, and then, you know, and then suddenly nothing happens, you know? So you have a lot of ideas, but you don't feel able to implement them on an individual level. Any thoughts on that? What should you do if you attend a seminar like this and you really want to make it worth your while? Well, what you have to do, <clears throat> Ben, is I want every one of you here participating, and it sounds like it's the biggest crowd that you've had in a, in a few years, is to go home within this next week and call everybody who's important in your, uh, your work life, you know, people who report to you and all, and teach them what you've learned here. How many of you know that the best way to learn something is to have to teach it? And so what you need to do is take your notes and organize them and all, and when you get back home, uh, teach it. And don't just read your notes, you know, organize it so you maybe have an outline, but you can teach uh, them. And so that's my first suggestion. you got to teach people. The second one, Ben, the most powerful thing we've been doing in the last number of years is asking managers, and I ask all of you, no matter whether you got a small operation at all, you have to spend at least 15 to 30 minutes once every two weeks meeting with each of your direct reports. We call this one-on-ones. And it's your job as the manager to schedule that meeting, and then it's their job to set the agenda. And they can talk about anything they want. They might have a sick kid that means they can't, you know, be doing as much this next week or so and all. They might want to talk about a goal and how you might help them. If you met 26 times a year with each of your direct reports, would you know them better? Would they know you? Would you right. be implementing <coughs> the goals and the strategy and all? Yeah. Peter Drucker, Ben, as you know, he often said, nothing good happens by accident. Put some structure on it. For example, I don't know how many of you all are married, but if you want a good marriage, one of the things we're doing in the United States now uh, is couples are having what we call date night. They go out for dinner once every two weeks, and the rule is you can't talk about the kids, you can't talk about work, you got to talk about your relationship. And if you did that 26 times a year, you wouldn't go home someday and there's a moving van there getting the furniture out because <laughs> your wife or your husband is leaving. And you say, I didn't know. Well, why don't you talk to him once in a while? Hey, is that what you <laughs> and Marjorie also have been doing over the past few years? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it, re it really is fun. And it's, and it's a powerful. We've only been married 53 years, so uh, we've been doing pretty well. Wow.